Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about sets. Now I have the definition of a set up on the screen. A set is an unordered collection of objects. So really what we're doing is we're just grouping a whole bunch of stuff together. So for example, the way we define a set is we use these curly braces like this, and we can put whatever we want in here. So we'll add a one, a, B, C, maybe this very quick drawing of a cat or a bat, I guess, is what that looks like more. And I'm also going to throw a negative 4.7 in here just for kicks. So what we have is that we've just grouped together a bunch of objects into the set. Now, we say that the objects contained in a set are called the elements of that set. So one is an element of our set. Cat bat thing is an element of our set. Negative 4.7 is an element of our set and so on. We would also say that a set contains its elements. So our set contains one ABC bat, and for negative 4.7. So when we're looking at a set, the thing that we really care about is whether certain objects are contained within a set or whether certain objects are not contained within a set. So for example, two is not in this set, but negative 4.7 is in the set. And that's really what matters most when we're talking about sets. We don't care about how many times each element shows up in the set. We don't care about what order each element is in the set. We just want to know what is in the set, what is not in the set. So if we have a set and we say that that set contains one, one, two, and three, for example, what we're saying here is we're saying, okay, well, one is an element of the set. One is an element of the set. Two is an element of the set. And three is the element of the set. So really this has some redundant information because both of these ones tell us that one is an element. So we don't really need to worry about duplicates. We can just completely get rid of them. So we can say that this set, the set containing one, two, and three really contains the same information as the set containing one, one, two, and three. So we can also look at a case like two, three, one. What this says is that, okay, well, two is an element of the set, three is an element of the set, and one is an element of the set. And honestly, again, this isn't saying anything new that this set isn't saying. So really, we don't care about duplicate elements. We don't care about order. When we're writing out sets and writing out all of the elements of our set, we can really get rid of all the duplicates. And if all of the elements in a set are orderable in some way, like the set only contains numbers or something like that, then we can just write all those numbers out in order. That's sort of the standard way of talking about sets usually, and it helps us uh, work with sets a lot easier sometimes. Now, something we can actually do is we can give sets names. So I'm going to give this set a capital A, the name capital A. So we're saying A is the set containing one, ABC, bat, and negative 4.7. Capital letters are usually what we call sets. Uh, sometimes we use the letter S, sometimes it's A and B. It doesn't really matter, but capital letters is mostly what people use here. We actually have some special sets that have special names. So for example, we can talk about this. So this is the letter N, but it's written in a font that's called Blackboard Bold, where we have these two lines here. Really, this is just a very fancy way of writing an N. And we say that N is the set of all natural numbers. So really, if we were to try to write out every element in N, in our natural numbers set, it would be 0, 1, 2, 
three, four, five. And I don't want to keep on writing because otherwise I'd have an infinitely long video, which isn't very much fun to watch. So I'll just truncate this with a dot, dot, dot. So we have n for natural numbers. Similarly to that, we have z for the set of z integers, I guess. I'm not sure why they use z, but it's equal to the set of all integers. So that's going to be negative everything negative, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and everything else positive. Again, I'm using dot dot dots to truncate the set because I don't want to write out every element of the integers forever. If we want to talk about the rational numbers, we use Q, again for reasons unknown. The set of all rational numbers. And due to the fact that the rational numbers are continuous, like we discussed in the last video, I'm not even going to try to write this set out. I could list a bunch of elements, but it's not really going to be in any fun order to write out. Then we also have the real numbers. We've returned to some sense of, you know, the letters actually making sense for this for the uh, sets that they stand for. So this is the set of all real numbers. And finally, for those complex numbers that we briefly mentioned last time, that's going to be C, complex numbers. So it occurs to me that I completely forgot to define another type of number in my numbers video, and as of this recording, I've already finished editing that, so I'm just going to define it now. But we're going to let p be some natural number that is greater than 1. We say that p is a prime number if it is only divisible by 1 and p. I want to note that we specifically say p has to be greater than 1, and that has to do with a problem called prime factorization. We say that every number is e exactly equal to one single multiplication of prime numbers. And if we said that one is a prime number, then things get a little complicated that way. That's a little bit outside of the scope of this class, but just know that the, prime, the smallest prime number is two and one is not a prime number. We also say that a natural number that is not prime is considered compound. So, if we want to look at the set containing all, all prime numbers, this actually has a special name as well. That's going to be P, which is going to be 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on. That is the set of all prime numbers. So moving on to a slightly new concept, we talked about before that one of the big properties we really care about with sets is whether they contain certain objects or don't contain certain objects. And this kind of leads into another property, which talks about how many objects a certain set contains. So this brings us into our definition of cardinality, which is displayed up on the screen. We'll let S be a set if we can say that S contains exactly n distinct elements, then it has cardinality n. So cardinality is really just a way of saying this is how many elements a set has. And the way we do that is we draw the name of our set S, but we'll also put what look like absolute value signs around it. But don't be fooled, even though they look exactly the same, when we talk about sets, putting those two vertical bars around it means cardinality, not absolute value of a set. Because the thing is, is that you can't take absolute value of a set. So vertical bars around a set means cardinality always. We'll say that the cardinality of S equals N, or that S has N objects in it. So the set 1, 2, 3, the cardinality of this equals 3, because it has three distinct elements. So when we're talking about the cardinality of a set, 
I want to focus on what types of numbers the cardinality of a set can actually be. So certainly we can have a set containing one element. This is sometimes called a singleton set. So this is a set containing one element. You can certainly have a set with two elements, four and seven, let's say. We have a set with a cardinality three elements up above. If you give me a positive integer, I could easily make a set with the cardinality of that integer just by including that many random elements in there. However, we can also have a set with a cardinality of zero. And that's going to be what we call an empty set. So we can define the empty set as a set containing zero elements. So if we want to actually write out the empty set, there's a couple of ways we can write that. The first is we can use empty brackets like this. It's a literally a set containing no items. Or we can also write out this. It looks a lot like the null sign. In this context, it's an empty set sign. And if we want to take the cardinality of the empty set, that's going to be zero elements. So the cardinality of a set will always be a natural number which means that sets are actually discrete objects. We can see this by looking at our two example sets above here. We're looking at the set containing one object versus the set containing two objects. There's a one object difference between these two sets. And there's a one object difference between a set containing two objects and a set containing three objects. So to sum up this video, sets are discrete structures. They are objects that contain other objects inside of them. Now, some of you may have the question, well, can you put a set within a set? And you absolutely can. So for example, we can make the set of all sets that we've seen today. So that'll be one, A, B, C, weird bat cat thing, negative 4.7. That is the first set inside of our larger set. Then we have one, two, three, one, and four, and seven. This is a set containing other sets, and this is totally possible for us to have. Really, a set can contain any object, any mathematical object that we encounter in this class. So that's our brief introduction to sets. We'll certainly see a lot more of them as we continue along the quarter. But for the next video, we'll actually be giving a mathematical definition of graphs, so stay tuned for that.